If the Bible's got you tied in knots If you're burdened with religious thoughts Come grab a drink and join the choir It's Heretic Happy Hour Well, dearly beloved, we are gathered here again once more for a Another amazing episode of the Heretic Happy Hour podcast. I am your host, Keith Giles, one of three, and I am joined by my friends Matt and Jamal. Say hi, guys. Hi, friends. This is Jamal Javanji. I am author of Free to Love and soon to be the author of <clears throat> Living for a Living. It's good to be back with you guys. Ooh, exciting news. And I'm Matt DiStefano, author of uh, four books, the latest being uh, Heretic on Choir Publishing. And uh, before we get this ball rolling, I just have an update that we have at our Heretic Happy Hour store. We have three new designs for t-shirts. So if you go to heretichappyhour.com slash store, you can see those three new designs right up, right up at the top. And if you, it's, it's almost Christmas time coming up. So if you, they, these make perfect gifts. So check them out. If you like them, that's awesome. If you don't, well, don't buy one, but if you do, if you get, <laughs> if you get rush shipping, you can get it by Christmas. So I Dude, already, these shirts, I already they're ordered. Awesome. I'm excited. Yeah. They're totally awesome. They're really cool. Ralph killed it. Yeah. He killed it. Hey, uh, speaking of that, let's talk about Patreon. Uh, we have Patreon. Patreon. Yes. We have a Patreon page for, the diehard Heretic Happy Hour fans. These are the ones who just cannot get enough of the Heretic Happy Hour podcast. And for just as little as $2, I think, or no, $5, $5 or more, uh, there's different levels and, and uh, benefits and rewards. But uh, you get to unlock bonus content. We, we record uh, extra content just for you guys. We also have uh, bonus interview footage with our, some of our guests like uh, William Paul Young, the author of The Shack and Nadia Boltzweber and uh, Rachel, um, Rachel Held Evans. And, uh, sometimes this guy named Jamal posts there too. Yeah, sometimes this guy Jamal posts crazy things there. And you get all kinds of like bonus content uh, for being a, a supporter of the Heretic Happy Hour podcast. And I want to thank some of our most recent donors. We couldn't do this without you guys. Daniel Rogers, Sarah Arbor, Michelle Ducote, or Ducote, Ducote. Rob Andrus, Henry Peters, Ellen Rumpf, and Michelle Burdett. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Actually, can I, Keith? Can can I? I have an alternate pronunciation possibility. And I think it's Michelle Dusote. That's just a guess, though. Do you know this person? No. Okay. Well, then maybe I, it's Ducote, Dusote, Ducote, or something. Or or Ducote. Yes. Okay. And speaking speaking of money. Um, just a little bit of trivia, just to change things up a little bit. Do you guys know the richest country in Europe? No. Uh, no. It would be Ireland. Why? Why? Because the capital of Ireland is always Dublin. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jeez. It's been a while since one of those jokes was dropped oh, on yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Way to bring that back, Jamal. <laughs> I do what I can. Yeah, as always. <clears throat> I do have an announcement. and. um Again, uh, last week we had breaking news, so I'll just repeat it again this week. We have a hotline. We have a hotline, absolutely. And the number, I'm just going to provide the number here because we have it in our notes. It's 240-343-7379. Unless you have a rotary phone, you could also do the letters, which is 2403-HERESY. So anyway, we would really appreciate, um, really appreciate, um, if you guys would call in with your voicemails and texts, we always love to hear from the listeners. It's fantastic. And this week we had two text messages come in. So engineer, can you put those up? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. Here's the first text quote. Hey guys, I love the podcast. Keep up the good work. Here's my question. What is sexual morality and how do we live as, how do we live a sexually moral life? I know, I know I and countless others are unclear on this, would appreciate some input and maybe even some book podcast recommendations if you have any. Thanks, fellas. God bless. Hmm. That's a great, it's a that's great a good, text. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, we should do like a whole series on this, like maybe like a sex series or something. 
You know, that'd be a good idea. Maybe we'll do yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we should put that together. Yeah. Write that sure. down. That would be really good. Yeah. Which actually, we are going to do that. We are going to have a sex series. Oh, that's, up that's when I heard that. Yeah. Okay. That, yes. Okay. So that will be one podcast here on the Heretic Happy Hour. You can check that out in January. Totally. Uh, totally. Do you guys have any yeah. quick thoughts for the, for the listener? Um, my only thought about the question is like when he asked, what is sexual morality and how do we live a sexual moral life? It's sort of like, well, who, it depends on who you ask. Like if you ask the Pope, he'll tell you. And then if you want to make him happy, then do what the Pope says. If you or ask your pastor and then he'll give you a, he'll give you an answer. And then, then just do what he says. If you want to make him happy, it's sort of like, it's, it's kind of relative in a way because it's sort of like, it well, depends on who you ask and what, what standard you use, pick one you like, and then follow it because they are sort of, it depends on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I have, I have one quick thought. I love what Paul says in first Corinthians 10, where he says, um, like all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are not are lawful, but not all things build up. Um, so it's kind of like one of those things. Well, how do we live a sexually moral life? Well, we kind of have to, I think we have to, be okay with figuring it out along the way and saying what what is beneficial for me and what is not. And what I found just living 36 years on this life is some things are beneficial for me and not beneficial for someone else. And some things are beneficial for someone else and not me. So that's when I think a lot of personal responsibility comes into it. That's just my quick thoughts on it. Mm, that's good. Yeah, I just, if I were to... <clears throat> you know, speak to the listener. I I think I would say there's two ways you could look at anything. And I think sex is a part of this. You could look at things through the grid of what is right and what is wrong. You know, what is morally acceptable and what is morally unacceptable, which is that grid of good and evil, right and wrong. I really feel like that is a very destructive way to live. It takes a lot of energy to try to discern what is right and what is wrong. And then when you put a lot of energy into that, you don't live, you miss life. So I think there's a better way to live and that's really just experiencing life. And so I like to ask this question, you know, specifically when it comes to anything, but sex, I think is great. You can say, what is the highest? I always like to ask this question, not what is permissible, what is, what is, what is legal, what is illegal, but what is the highest purpose of sex? And if you really want to think about it, because obviously I think as you as a listener, you're, you want, I think that's your heart is you really want to know, like, like what, what's, what is the highest, I think that's what you're asking. What is the highest purpose of sex? Instead of like putting it in the grid of right and wrong, good and evil, like asking that question, like what, what, do you, what is your heart's desire? What do you hope the, the highest thing that your sexual life will achieve? And just asking that question. I do think there's a lot to get into. And what, obviously we're going to do that on the Heritage Cap We're going to have a whole series on sex, which I think will be good to do. But, um, but I would ask that question as opposed to what's right, not what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, but what is the highest purpose for your sexual life? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like that. I think, yeah, it'll be an interesting series, what we have coming up. I can't wait. It's going to be so great. We got another text, right, Jamal? Another text, yep. So, quote, this is from another listener. Hi, guys, especially Matt, LOL. Oh, okay. My my name's Nate, and I've been listening to the show for about two months because a friend showed it to me. I can't say that I agree with all you guys. They're probably talking about you guys. I can't say that I agree with all you guys, but I really love the conversation. You guys are open um, and willing to disagree, but you love each other. And to me, that's what it's all about. On to my question. I am 18 and nowhere near being married, but I do have a girlfriend who I met at church and she and I have extremely different views on a lot of different issues in terms of God. The nice thing is I know I don't have to convince her that I'm right and she doesn't have to convince me that she's right. The problem that I have run into is the idea of, quote, train up a child, train up the child in the way he should go, unquote. How do you balance between the two parents what you teach your children if you don't agree? Thanks, guys. Uh, Again, love the show. God bless. Wow. I just wanted to, I'll just jump in first here. Yeah, please. But to me, <clears throat> I know where he's coming from because when he when he uses that in quotes, right, and it's quoting a Bible verse, train up a child in the way he should go. What he thinks that means is what we've all been told that means is make sure you are teaching your child theology and doctrine. But that's not, I don't think that's what that's saying. I think I think two parents 
who have slightly different views of, of theology or doctrine or even who God is or there is or isn't a God. I think if, if two parents weren't on the same page with that, they could both successfully train up a child in the way he should go by telling that child, t- training that child to be a good person who loves people, who cares about people, who's respectful, who's kind, who's giving, who's thoughtful. You know, uh, you know what I'm saying? I think that's closer to training up a child in the way he should go, uh, not telling the child what to believe. That's indoctrination. Um, mm. And so I think, of course, it's probably for the best if you and your spouse do agree uh, on most things. Uh, you're going to have a lot less stress in your marriage if that's the case. But I don't think it's something where if you don't agree, or let's say you agree in the beginning, but later on in the marriage, one of you goes a different direction or changes their view, which does happen, um, then the foundation of your marriage shouldn't be an agreement on theology or, or those kind of things. You know, you, you sh- Your foundation should be something else. Like hopefully that you love one another and respect one another. Yeah. You know, uh, my thought on that is... Well, first of all, I think it's great. I mean, obviously, you know, the listener is 18 and is so so awesome that you're approaching getting into a relationship consciously. And, you know, obviously, even when you do get married and you end up having children, the idea, let, let's say both of you are on very different pages. When it comes to, say, this girl you're dating, you know, you, you end up getting married and you don't agree on theology or even how to parent a kid. <clears throat> that can bring tension if the assumption is that you both need to be on the same page, you know. Now, because then you won't be, and then you'll be and have a lot of conflict. But I think con- just being realistic and, com- and 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 being very clear in your communication can be really helpful. If you, you know, just be honest with your girlfriend, and say, "Yeah, you know, um, I don't pretend that we need to be on the same page because we're not. I'm okay with that. If you both are okay with that, then when it comes to children, you can just keep that very clear communication present, you know, and <clears throat> in a respectful way. You can respect. Let's say your child is older, and mom does believes one thing and is doing is parenting one way and uh, you're in a different place. I mean, it can bring tension, but one of the things you can do is you can say, you know, um, your mom, this is how your mom believes This is how your mom does things. And I believe differently. So, um, you know, I respect your mom and where she's at, but this is, this is how I feel about it. And you can just be very clear in your communication. Like, yeah. Um, you know, I just approach things very differently. You can communicate that to your kid, you know, and, um, it, may bring up it, it you're demonstrating um tolerance and acceptance even in that even in that how you approach that and again you know your spouse may or may not be okay with that but again just honest and clear communication just saying you know what i know that's where you're at and that's how you feel um but um this is this is where i stand and this is what i'm willing to do and here's what i'm willing not to do you know again when if it comes to things like punishment and you know, spanking and that kind of thing that can be a little more sticky, you know, because then if you think something may be abusive, then for you to like let your spouse act in an abusive way to your kid could, could bring up a lot of issues. I, I definitely agree with that. That's why I think having these conversations early on and just being very open can be real helpful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll just, uh, two, I'll give two quick, uh, thoughts or one quick thought before we move on to the heretic of the week. But, I, I, in our house, we don't really like teach beliefs necessarily. It's more about like how we practice our lives and how we live yeah. and how we treat each other. So it's, you know, if you want to use the technical terms, it's orthopraxy, like correct practice over orthodoxy, like our doctrines, yes. you know, it's, Amen. it's, it's, it's really that. So yeah. How do you get into these sticky situations to spank or not to spank and how are you going to discipline and all that? I think it's, um, my advice is to not have children when you're, when you're working through these things like there are so so don't don't worry about the doctrines that you believe first off worry about how are you going to live with the child and and come be vulnerable and have these conversations um before you have kids and and get on the same page in terms of those because those are the things that matter the doctrines that's all secondary it's fun to talk about theology but it's more important how we treat each other and that we're on the same page especially when you bring kids into the world so that's my two quick um or two quick thoughts and i guess it's now time for the heretic of the week it's the heretic of the week hi my name is brady toops and i'm a heretic but i'd rather be happy hour <laughs> <laughs> hi brady hi, hi, brady. <laughs> brady it is such an honor uh to have you on the heretic happy hour um 
and this is Jamal, by the way, for the listeners, but uh, I am, um, I, I, it's just kind of a treat for me because I've known Brady for the last several years. We go back to Nashville, the days when I used to live in Nashville, Tennessee, and Brady is uh, living there in Nashville and is a singer, songwriter, extraordinaire, former contestant on ABC's The Bachelorette, I believe. <laughs> we, we, we need to keep that in yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but I but it's been a pleasure for me to like to know Brady for going back a few years. Actually, um, and I've told this to Brady, I've had him on my own personal uh podcast called the love cast just a little plug there but um but i it it was um it's been an honor to know him because brady has been instrumental in my heretic journey oh, um, stop it, bro. <laughs> serious seriously we've had <laughs> we've had a series of conversations going back several years that it just like i've had these conversations with brady at the key, at key times in my life hmm. in which like i didn't even know that i needed to hear some things and then we'd have a conversation and it was like a lid would be taken off of me and my thinking would just seriously evolve or expand beyond anything I could have imagined. And, and, and it just key moments in my journey. Hmm. It's like, like Carl Pearson said, when, <clears throat> when the student is ready, you're up here. And um, that has exactly been my experience. And so I feel like Brady has had a huge role in my life. Like when I've been ready to hear some things that if I'd have heard him a little before, I'd have freaked out. But when I was ready to hear it, I heard it. My thinking expanded. Yeah, so I'm just very thankful for you, Brady. I'm thankful that you're on the you're you're our guest on uh, the Heritage Happy Hour. So I'll just jump off with the first question. If that's well, first right. off, I, I hope that that it's done more help than harm <laughs> in the process. <laughs> Any more story? Well, for me, it, I feel like it's been helpful, but some people may say it's harmful. But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, the, the first question we love to ask our guests, and we'll ask you, is um, why why would some people consider you a heretic? <laughs> what a great question. And I think it's hard to answer that. We could get in some specifics, but I, I kind of think of heresy might be might if it's defined as that which is against the status quo or maybe it are beliefs that are held um, by you know by me that aren't necessarily part of the mass populace. I would say that there may na- there may be no end to my hereticism, if you will. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, what what do you guys like to focus on in the heresy world? Oh gosh, um, man, you know we. Well, I think uh, not to speak for everybody on the podcast here, but um, one of the things that we like we just like to challenge preconceived ideas, like basically yeah. that um, this idea that a fear based God in which we are following the right. divine with an underlying uh, foundation of fear, whether that be, right. you know, hell when you die or, or just even this mm-hmm. idea of needing to meet a certain standard and live up to a certain standard. I know I've, that's been a huge part of my yeah. deconstruction uh, mm-hmm. spiritually, obviously deconstructing the Bible. Um, yeah. You know, for me, I think uh, I definitely don't believe the story that I was told as a kid. And that story was, we are uh, somehow separated from God because of this man that ate a fruit uh, a few thousand years ago. And uh, the way back to the good graces of this God is to recite a prayer that is based primarily on a cognitive belief system. And if you say the secret passcode, Jesus, who's the way, truth, and the life to get into heaven, then you're good and you don't get punished by this God who then poured out his wrath and his son. So you could be saved. That whole story. I don't believe. <laughs> that, that makes, so that would probably make me a heretic. <laughs> yeah. So Brady, what you're saying is you're not a Christian. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that was a joke. That no, was a joke. Exactly. Kids. The hard part is <laughs> it's hard to, and late identifying with labels, right? What is a Christian? What is a heretic? What does it even all mean? Mm. And I don't think Jesus was all that concerned with the the labels. You know, he wasn't the one that created Christianity. We did. Mm, I like it. Right, right. Mm. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty amazing when you remind people that Jesus was never not right. a Jew. <laughs> and it's yeah. funny because, you know, in my understanding of Judaism, it was more of a culture than it was necessarily a religion. We sort of made it into a religion, but they did have a set of, you know, norms, cultural norms, certain belief systems and certain ideologies 
that in a lot of ways, the Jesus that I read about actually came to flip it on its head in, in a way, you know, even show yeah. them a yeah. better way. And then it's interesting how humans like to create religions and institutions to wield power and, and harness, you know, harness those ideologies for their own benefit. Yeah, that, that does seem to be the case, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess we could go back to sort of the story that I was talking about. I actually don't believe we can be separated from God. I think it's impossible. I think as, you know, as fish are in the ocean, we are in God. And a lot of these ideas are if you read if you read the the Bible, if you read between the lines enough and you see through a certain lens, these things aren't you know, they're not, um, they are in the Bible, right? Paul says, I think it's the Acts 17 or something where in him we live and move and have our being, you know, that what separates from God, us from God isn't sin, that it's probably more shame. It's the belief in somehow that we are separated, the belief that somehow we don't have inherent value and dignity, you know, uh, that Jesus maybe came not necessarily to change God's mind about us, but to change our minds about what God was actually like. That's, I stole that from Richard Rohr, who you guys have had on, who's been quite influential, quite influential in my path and my way. And, you know, the idea somehow that a belief system is what gets you into heaven. First off, I don't necessarily believe in a, I don't know if I believe in a literal heaven and hell as far as an afterlife goes. I think Jesus was probably more preoccupied with the, the modern reality, right? This moment, like, are you experiencing heaven? Are you experiencing hell in this moment? Are you suffering or are you not? And I think he came to show us how do we live in supreme enjoyment and bliss and exist in a way of being on the earth that um, that helps our fellow man. You know, so I think the story that I was told growing up was a was a limited like Sunday school story that just got to this point where actually it started not working for me anymore. It just didn't make sense. And we could probably get into why that happened, but that kind of gives an overview that is a bit more, ex, 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 you know, explaining my previous heretic statement yeah. <laughs> of what I don't believe. Yeah. So, so Brady, uh, this is Keith. So yeah. Could you could maybe go into some of like why you started to question that stuff? I mean, you know, you you were you were going right along for a while there, and you felt like um, this story was true. And we've all been we've all heard that story. Many of us grew up hearing that story. Uh, by the way, now I know where Jamal gets all this crazy ideas from. So uh, it's all becoming clear now. <laughs> <laughs> but, I love it. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 can I just be honest, Brady? Uh, so before this interview, if, right before we did this interview. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at your website and I'm like, yeah, you know, this guy doesn't seem very controversial to me. I mean, is he really a heretic? Uh, I'm not sure. And then you you just completely uh set me at ease. You you're you're definitely in the heretic family. Uh that's beautiful. Uh but no, I mean, so so everybody comes to a place where they where they start to question some of that story. Some people kind of bury the question because they're afraid you know they're they're going to be called a heretic or they're going to be excommunicated or maybe they're they're going to stop being a christian if they if they have those doubts and so yeah. you know um yeah. so so what, were there some things that kind of what was the first time you kind of started wondering what's up with this yeah i think for me one of the major catalysts was some pain that was centered around leadership within church and I was a part of the church. I've been part of the church growing up most of my life. And when there was some breakdowns in that, the idea that maybe the people who are, in quotes, leading or over me, which I don't believe in that idea necessarily either, uh, maybe they're not 100% right all the time. And maybe they don't have my best interests in mind. I was always a little bit bothered by some of the institutional structures and some of the value system that's attached to the maintaining an institution. I was always bothered by that, but I think ultimately the breakdown of relationship made me go, wait a second, what is this? And who are these people and what are they saying? And I went right to the Bible and because I've been a pretty intense student of the Bible most of my life. And 
I thought, well, what what is what does the Bible have to say about leadership in church and in church in general as far as structure of the church goes? And then when I when I went into that, I actually started researching tithing. It was kind of a big thing. I go, well, tithing is kind of a cornerstone element to the modern church structure. And I read a thesis. Oh, yeah. I read a doctoral thesis on tithing and why it wasn't uh, sort of a New Testament biblical idea or should be trans transposed onto the modern structure of church. And when I start when I started to question tithing, I actually stopped tithing as a practice, sort of this, you know, yep. uh, this experiment to see how that would affect things. Because I still had this idea that God was um this transactional God that we could be on the good graces of if we did if we did the right things, right? Because I was told if you tithe, if you submit, if you're faithful, then God blesses you. And I stopped tithing and I still was, I, I was okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't get smited, you yeah. know, by the, by the <laughs> Zeus God in the sky. But wait a minute, wait a minute. So wait a minute. So God didn't put holes in your pockets <laughs> and uh, exactly. I didn't, you know, just <laughs> start losing digits from my bank account numbers. You know, it didn't happen. So, but what did happen is there started to be a, a bit of a, suspicion i was looked at from <laughs> in suspicion from different leadership in the church i was a part of and and then i i was sort of was let go of the ability to be a part of the worship team because i've been a musician and helped out and stuff and then that kind of began the whole process so i went to the bible and then i started questioning what the bible was because i started looking at some of the, the things i never saw with sort of new eyes, things like divinely sanctioned violence in the Old Testament. Oh, wait, there's a God who tells the Jewish people to wipe out entire other people groups? That sounds a bit like Hitler. That sounds like the worst dictator in yeah. the history of humanity. And this is the God that I am supposed to love and sing to and worship? That doesn't seem right to me. How could I, how could I worship a God who's worse than Hitler? Uh and yep. that went down the rabbit hole of, yep. okay, well, what is God? What, what is the Judeo-Christian narrative? Where did it come from? Uh, Re-examining the Bible, redefining what that book was for me. And then I got, actually, actually, I got to this point where I questioned even the existence of God. It was sort of this unraveling process that got finally down to the bare bones of, does God even exist? And that was a, that was a very scary moment for me. It happened a couple, mm. few years ago. I was walking the streets of LA and I started to entertain that idea and I never had entertained that idea. I think growing up in a Christian household and being told these stories from a very young age, it was just something I assumed was true. But for me, it was less about, uh, it was less about believing, unbelieving in the God that I believed in. It was more about, I think it was just more about dying to the image of God that I'd created in my mind. And that allowed for something more right, beautiful right. Uh, and even a deeper experience of spirituality than what I had previously known. And I think one of the things I was influenced by in that process was a quote that I read from Carl Rahner, who is instrumental in the Vatican II Council, a Catholic priest. And he said, in the days to come, speaking of Christianity, you will either be a mystic, meaning one who has experienced God for real or nothing at all. And I think my transition was about moving out of a primarily belief-centered experience of God into the real experience of God that has less to do with a grasping of the mind and more of an overall experience of the mystery that is the divine. You know, we experience the divine in all sorts of different ways, and then we try to name it. We try to use the language to... Uh, project onto this experience. The problem is language always comes up short. And I got to this point where it was less mm. important about having the right or correct language. And it was more important to me on a personal level and more enjoyable uh, on a personal level by experiencing the wonder of the divine. You know, it's, it's a different, it's like, I think of it as a, uh, a sort of a sunset you can either look at a sunset and stare and wonder and awe when all time stops and language doesn't suffice, 
Or you can look at it in a very analytical way and try to say these are the colors and this is why and this is the way that the light is refracting off the you know the horizon. I, I, I got tired of of that that way, that sort of rational comprehension of God and who's right and who's wrong and who's what's true and what's false and who's the false prophet and who's the the right teacher we can listen to. And I just thought, you know, I just kind of want to look at the sunset and 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 not stop you know, not stop from feeling this, this, this sense of awe of wonder. Yeah. So. so can I, can I ask you, Brady, uh, to go back a little bit? Cause you were talking about, you know, there was a moment a year or so ago when you were walking down the streets of LA and your deconstruction brought you sort of to the edge of faith mm-hmm. and even questioning whether there is a God at all. And I've, I've been there as well. I think, uh, and I think we probably all, all three of us, uh, all four of us here on this conversation, um, have had that experience or kind of at least brushed up against that, whether we went all the way across the line and came back or, or at least came very close to the edge of that cliff. Uh, so can you talk about that a little bit specifically? Like, was there some specific thing that caused you to doubt and, and what was it that brought you back? I guess what caused me to doubt was I, I felt like I needed to go to the end of the unraveling process and the end of the unraveling process ultimately was the, the belief in God. And it was more a resting on my belief systems. So all my belief systems, one by one, began to strip, be stripped away. And it started with what is church, and then it went to, you know, what is the Bible, and then it went to what is basically religion, and then it went to what is God. And in the examining of what is God, I had to consider the idea that maybe God didn't exist. And it wasn't, it was scary because I then at that point thought, well, what what is the meaning of my whole life then? Because my the, the construct that I'd created in my mind was that meaning was derived around the existence of God, that my whole life flowed out of that thing. And I've always been sort of intensely curious about spirituality, about God in my whole life. So I had to look back and go, wait, did, did, was my whole life, was it for nothing? Did I give myself to an illusion or did I give myself to something real. Right. And part of what had to die, I think, in that moment was the belief in a God, or the belief in a, sto- in, a, in a story that was founded out of fear and that had God at the head of that story. So when I died to sort of this image of a God that sends people to hell and has, you know, tells people, tells its Israelites to wipe out entire people groups in the Old Testament. It gave a, ch- a chance, I think, for me to experience God in a holy light. Now, I'd also had some mystical experiences in my early 20s with this sort of divine love, for lack of a better term, that really shaped my, my belief systems and my reality. But, and I think I, I always came back to that in a sense where I said, this is, that's the most real experience I've ever had. And what, and what is that? I may begin to name it in different ways, but I, I also knew that it wasn't the naming that ultimately was, uh, the naming of it wasn't what proved, you know, whether I was spiritual or not. It was actually more the experience of it. So I wanted a spirituality. I wanted to be connected to something bigger and deeper than myself. I still wanted that. And I needed a new sort of pathway or avenue into that. So that's probably what drew me back. Wow. Brady is so good. So good. And and I yeah. I think um this is a, a thought that comes to mind as you're as you're sharing. And, and and even when people talk about losing faith in God or even becoming an atheist, I think um the concept of God that obviously comes out of traditional Christianity or religion in general is this theism, this idea of, of this theistic God, mm. this man upstairs or being that's, you know, controlling everything and that's all powerful and kind of sits above and beyond yeah. somewhere, you know, somewhere out there. And I think that's what people conceive of as theism. To me, that's pretty myth- mythological. You know, it's very consistent with yeah. most of our human mythologies. And obviously as we evolve, we realize this is not... <laughs> 
you know, this isn't real. But um, and so then that leads to atheism, which is like, OK, I don't believe in this theistic God, but I do believe it's po- and this is where I've come. And I think that's, that's probably where you are as well. But I do believe it's possible to believe in yes. God and not be a theist. And um, and I don't think that's just some like, you know, some people are like, well, that's just some esoteric or Eastern way of um, thinking. But I, I just think like, like I think true to truly understand the divine. And I don't mean understand cognitively because that's impossible, yeah. but to have to understand through experience is to understand God in, mm. a, in, a, in a non-theistic way. And I, I we're, we want to do a whole show on this idea of like, can you be an atheist well, and still believe in God? And I think you can, um, because I, mm-hmm. actually, I think maybe that's that's the only way to really truly grasp the divine is through mm-hmm. atheism, which sounds crazy. But uh, maybe you could touch on that a little bit. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I'm not sure God cares <laughs> if you right. believe in him or not. Right. <laughs> or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. I'm not g- sure God cares whether you believe in her or not, <laughs> right. you know. So, uh, I say that to my female friends yes. whenever they reference God with a male pronoun. I go, wait, 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 wait! Like you mean her, right? <laughs> you don't mean him. And they they always they they like they they kind of like turn their head and then they start laughing because <laughs> from a white male, right, who's been who knows white privilege and male privilege in the world today, when I correct them for their male pronoun to say a, a female pronoun of God. It's, it's just a fun kind of healing moment. Anyway, that's kind of beside the point. But I like, like I said earlier, I don't think God cares whether you believe in God or not. It, it's like, like, would the ocean care that the fish believes in the ocean? I mean, it's just like, what? Like, I love that. That's, that's like, awesome. Why, why does it matter? Why does it, does it change the, experience of the fish, whether the fish is able to name or believe in the ocean. The fish just exists in the ocean. Now, I think that our beliefs can impact our experience, right? So in one in one sense of the word, I'll say, beliefs don't matter. And in the other sense of the word, I'll say, in sort of this non-dualistic understanding, beliefs actually do matter. So belief doesn't matter like we think it does. Mm-hmm. Belief doesn't get us in or out. But what we believe about the divine affects our experience of the divine. Right. Right. And I see, you know, a Christian heritage or, you know, you read through the church fathers and the the different, uh, the different saints and mystics throughout the ages. And when you look at like systematic theology, you go, oh, wow, these guys just argued over the finest points and just arguing and arguing over what they named God. Mm. And that to me isn't as attractive as, let's say, the the mystics like Julian of Norwich or Barthel Lawrence or St. Teresa of Avila, who kind of disappeared from the institution, the main institution, the Catholic Church. And said, well, we're not going to concern ourselves with these things. We just want to, you know, hide in a cave or in a monastery and experience the glories of love. This ever infilling relationship that we may not always be able to explain, but we know this is the, this is the essence of all life. Mm. And I, and I see people experiencing that mystery, that source in all sorts of different faith expressions and religions throughout the earth. Mm. How, how, wh- why is God somehow as narrow minded and, uh, and limited and sort of elitist trapped in one story as we think he is or the, that I was led to believe? And this idea that somehow we have the one truth that everyone else needs to believe or they are you know are punished for all of eternity it's just a crazy it's a it's just a it's a crazy outlandish insane thought i i totally totally agree with that um ready i I love what you're saying here our stories sort of resonate together um i i had the same sort of uh, I guess end game to my deconstruction was where there was nothing left, and I was on that agnostic atheistic fence. And so I, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm like nodding my head the whole time as you're talking. Um, and, and a lot of what you're saying is so good, Jamal. Going back, I think what you were what you were um, explaining was deism, not necessarily theism, but that's I guess beside the mm-hmm. point. 
Um, I, I guess since since we've been going about 25 minutes here, um, I, I want our listeners to be able to get in touch with you or or check out your work or or, or um, be known about what what you got going on um, in the future that you're excited about. So why don't you um, take a few minutes and let our listeners know where they can uh, where they can experience your work? Yeah, of course. So the, there's two ways I think you can engage with me. Two different platforms. One is BradyTubes.com. It's I play you know regularly concerts and I travel and uh, I do the singer songwriter thing, which I really love. And you can sort of you know check into that or Instagram, Brady Tubes, Twitter, all the socials. But the other thing that I have just recently started in the last uh, couple months is a new podcast called The Unravel with Brady Tubes, and it's where mm-hmm. I have. Uh, a number of guests I've interviewed about uh, these similar topics that we're talking about. And I sort of ask them the, the, the deep, big spiritual questions of life and God and meaning and, and see what they say. And, and it's been really fun. It's been a blast. I also have Q and a where people can call in and leave a message and I'll respond to it on the podcast. But I, I, I had this moment in the last year where I realized I get to have conversations with some of the most amazing people on the planet. And I always ask them different questions, you know, as I'm sort of exploring spirituality and just to see what they say. And so I thought, why don't I bring a few microphones along? Why don't I invite a few, few of these people into my studio in Nashville and record it for people to listen to? And it's been such a blast. So it's called The Unravel with Brady Tubes. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. And if you want to go check out the website, sort of as the basic hub for it, it's called The Unravel Podcast.com. Awesome. Man, sweet. Yeah. yeah. It, sounds, it sounds like a lot of the stuff that we do on this show. <laughs> so our, our listeners... Are you, guys is, you guys have your th- kind of three basic questions. I, I talk to my guests uh, in the first half of the interview about anything that lights them up in the realm of spirituality. And it can, it can go sort of anywhere it needs to go. And then in the second half of the interview, I have 10 questions that I ask every guest, the same 10 questions. And it starts out with, tell me something you used to be certain of. And mm. it's, a, you know, this idea mm. that as we grow and change and evolve, that our, our belief systems change and grow and evolve, and that's okay. And then it goes, what are you certain of now? And then we shift into what is the meaning of life? What is God? What happens after you die? If you could ask God question, one question, what would it be? You know, tell me something crazy that you believe that might surprise people. And it's sort of this progressive progression of questions that leads to a really fascinating, insightful, beautiful conversation. And for me on a personal level, one of the quotes that inspired it was from a Jewish philosopher in the 20th century called Martin Buber, who said, when two people authentically and humanly relate, God is the electricity that surges between them. And I found that the connection that's created in conversation, when two people uh, take down the guard and become authentic and with one another, it creates this electricity that is undeniable. And for me on a personal level, it creates this connection that I absolutely love. And if I could foster anything in the world, I'd want the conversation to be more important mm. than who's right and who's wrong. That's so good. Yeah. Amen, amen to that. Yeah. yeah. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brady. This has been a great conversation and um, man, really, really thought provoking stuff. Um, can't wait to check out more of what you've been doing. And uh, man, thank you so much for being of course. on the Heretic Happy Hour. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the listeners, I really encourage the listeners to check out your music. It's funny. I was uh, having uh, dinner with a couple of friends last night and they had like a little playlist on just, you know, random Spotify thing or whatever. And then it, uh, one of your songs comes on. I was like, no way. It's Brady's, Brady's right here on the radio. It's awesome. So it's cool. But I really appreciate your music and uh, they encourage the listeners to check your music out. It's fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and thank you for yeah, what you maybe, guys do. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Man, gosh, guys, I feel so privileged that we got to get that we got to have Brady Toops onto the program because uh, Brady's been just a huge blessing in my life and great. You know, I just I can't imagine my journey without that guy. And so I'm really, really, really excited that we we were able to have that conversation with him. Such 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 gold and what he shared. Yeah, that was fun. 
That was really fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. When um, when you first suggested him, I was like, "Who's this guy? What?" And then, uh, but man, after talking to him, I'm like, "Oh my gosh, wow!" Yeah, man, that was really, really a great conversation. He's a he's a jewel. He's yeah. a gold. He's a, and he was on the Bachelorette. Can you imagine that? I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It, if only the Bachelorette would, was more about like the conversation we just had, I, I would probably watch the Bachelorette. But unfortunately, I know they don't. They don't talk about those things. But Brady was also a uh, a renowned. I mean, he's a he's a profound musician, amazing musician. Was really really talented. But he used to be a worship leader. I mean, if that's hard to believe, he was actually a traditional worship leader back in the day. Which brings up our topic, which is yes, which yeah, is does worship is which, Jesus my girlfriend? Of course he is. <laughs> well. That's a, yeah, that's an interesting, uh, I'm so glad we were talking about this and, and we, we sort of have skirted around this topic, uh, in previous episodes. I know the last live episode we did, uh, somebody asked a question in the, in the question round, uh, right. Was something about that. Someone asked something about worship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really curious about what you, where you guys are at on this. And I, I feel like I'm probably somewhere between the middle between maybe where you, where you guys are going to land. I mean, I'm guessing just based on previous conversations we've had, but. I can. I used to work for Vineyard uh, Music Group uh, back in the '90s, and this was during the really the heyday of Vineyard worship. Like when there was a big Brownsville revival going on in Pensacola, Florida. There was a Toronto revival going on in um, in Toronto, and um, and Vineyard worship music was a huge part of that. I know a lot of those worship leaders. Um, really great guys. I even went down to to Pensacola, Florida for the Brownsville revival. I was there for two days. And actually experience some of that. Um, and so I, I, it's one of these things where, like, I guess, where I'm not a huge fan of sort of traditional, the tr- traditional model of church, that whole sort of sermon and a song and a preacher and a worship band and, you know, the big delights and the big, all that stuff, you know, the big performance and production. I'm not a big fan of that, but I really do uh, appreciate corporate worship. And sometimes I miss getting together with other Christians and, just singing and worshiping, you know, like that. But, um, but I also don't like the way that reinforces this sort of sermon and a song performance model. Um, but, I, but I think, and hopefully this is where we're going to get some territory we're going to cover in this, in this podcast episode. Like worship to me doesn't have to be this big sort of rock and rock band, you know, loud music experience, kind of like a concert experience. I mean, for me, what I've learned is, um, like worship is really just about connecting with God in, in a very simple way. It's like, and, and I've found that I can connect with God and have an amazing connection to God and a very worshipful experience by just sitting in silence for about 20 minutes, you know, or mm-hmm. um, in fact, that's, that, that right there has actually been some of the most profound times I've had recently um, yeah. is just sitting in silence or, you know, or getting out in nature or, or in meditating or, and maybe it could be singing or whatever. I think, um, the, the thing is, is that in the, it, even scripturally, if you're, if you're going to use the Bible as your, as your yardstick, you know, the Bible doesn't even talk about worship as singing really, right? In Romans 12, one talks about that your acceptable worship is really, it's your life. It's the way you live your life. Um, that's worship. And so, and like going even back, we were just talking about with orthopraxy, uh, that's worship really. Uh, living a life that honors God and points to him. Um, yeah. That's worship. But I, yeah, I just think we get so caught up in this idea of like creating, I don't know, a formula. And that's just what human beings do. So it's like we talk about worship as, oh, it's time for worship. And we sing like, you know, we might start out with an exciting song, but we end with a a, a, a more slow song in a minor key because based on what the sermon's going to be, if it's going to be uplifting or if it's going to be more like try to get people to come to the altar, then we're going to have this like slow song. We just, what I'm trying to say is that we just make it so formulaic that we miss all those opportunities that the church, if you want to call it that, can engage in worship in the mountains, at the ocean, um, just looking up at the stars. And we and we often miss those those things and not think of them as worship. And so that's, I did worship for like 10 years and it was very formulaic. Even the songs I thought sounded nice melodically or, or what have you, which were few and far between just on my personal tastes. It just was also week after week. It's just 
such a formula and such a ritualistic thing that I think then we miss the point. That's just my experience. I don't know. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> totally. I, um, I was once told when I was in the seminary or Bible college, I, um, was told that the job of a good worship leader is to put the pastor on the five yard line. No, and that, that, yeah, that <laughs> you're the, you're the John Stockton to his Malone, no, right? I mean, but you're right. I mean, and yeah, I think that's what Matt's talking about. I mean, that's the thing I don't like about worship is you, where it becomes essentially manipulative. It's like, let's emotionally, mm -hmm. let's lift everybody up. Let's make them cry. Let's get them ready. Okay. Now let's bring them down. And now the sermon's going to be about whatever. And so let's sing a song about that. And then here's pastor Bob. And then it, it just leads right into it. And it's like this slick produced kind of, I don't know, that thing mm -hmm. just bothers me. I really don't like that. Totally. Yeah. But I think, I think something powerful is happening in the traditional worship service. So like when people are worshiping, like it is like a drug, you know, for, so, you know, one of the things when people, and this is very consistent, when people are deconstructing their, their religion, their faith, and they, let's say they stop going to a traditional or institutional church that they're, they normally go to. And one of the things that they miss is the corporate singing time together. <clears throat> and I find that to be fascinating because it's just, just from a, like thinking about it from just a human psychology point of view, like what is going on in that space? What is going on in that time that makes it so healing or encouraging or just uplifting or, you know, because there's something profoundly, I think beautiful that does happen in that, you know? Um, and what I think is happening, just my perception of that is that people are really dropping down into their hearts. They're getting out of their head and they're moving into their heart. And I think anytime we move into our heart, you feel connected to the divine. You feel a sense of power and connection and awe and mystery and majesty. And I think that is anytime we move into our heart space, we are going to feel that. I personally believe that's where you find God is you move into your own heart. You move into the essence of your being. That's where God is. That's where the divine is. I think people are actually doing that unknowingly. They think they're singing to God outside of themselves and up in the sky. And that's why people look up or they have this profound, but they're really connecting, I believe, connecting to themselves, to the deepest part of themselves, which is where they're finding God. And I think I see this, you see this in concerts, the same kind of behavior that people engage in and like church services, people do that in concerts. You know, when there's, especially when there's like touching songs or like songs that are like really emotional or heart driven or, you know, about love, people will like move into the same kind of behavior that, that you would see in a worship service. So I think the same thing is happening. Or if you listen to a love song, it sounds like adoration. When people sing love songs and they dedicate songs to like the people they're in love with, like, you know, when like you dedicate, like, I don't know, like when I was a teenager way back in the day you know, I used to call on the, the radio station and like dedicate a song to my girlfriend, you know? And sometimes these, the lyrics of this, of this music is like, it is like worship. Like we're talking about how good a person is. And I think there's something profoundly beautiful when we get to connect with our heart and it gets expressed to another people just put Jesus in that space. But I think it's the same. I think people, it's good to worship other people. <laughs> It's really good. Yeah, I was, I was, waiting, I was for waiting for that too. I figured here, here it comes. It's, <laughs> it's really good. Well, first of all, we're following God's example when we worship other people, because if we if you're reading the Bible and if you take so there are some people that listen to this that actually believe in the Bible as a as a guidebook. So you think so. It, <laughs> there's some people. There's no. I don't know. Not anymore. I thought, no one. I thought we dealt with that. But. So, no, we're long past in, that. Come it, on. In the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis, can I, I can get, I want to get all Hebraic scholarly on people now. So in the book of Genesis in chapter one, when God says that talking about Adam and Eve, it says he blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. Well, the word, the, the Hebrew word for bless is actually the, I think it's Barak. I think it's the name the word for it. Um, and a Hebrew scholar can correct me here, but Barak is the word and it, it can be translated as worship. Now the translators didn't write that because that would be weird like, that God would, because when it says he blessed them, you know, we sometimes in our mind think, Oh God, like bless them. What does that even mean? But it, it, the, the word is literally worship. It can be translated worship. It means adoration to give adoration. So God, the divine adored, worshiped the human beings that he had fashioned, you know, and brought forth. And so if we worship, if humans worship, it's because we're just mirroring this divine essence that was first shown to us. Like, 
So, you know, it, I really honestly believe that that's the flow of love. Love is very worshipful. So we're, the object of love is the, like, that's the thing you're worshiping, whatever you're devoting your heart space to, your love. So it's beautiful. So we can direct that towards other people because, look, if you want to worship God, you need to worship other people because that's where God is. Well, um, I hate to mm. I hate to agree with you, Jamal, on on anything, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know I don't know if you're the one who gave me this idea. You probably are. I think I heard you say something about that once, or maybe it was somebody else. But I think it might have been you. And and so I started thinking about it. And so the Greek word for worship is pros, proskynio, I think is how it's Prostate, pronounced. Yeah, to lay, to lay. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's the, one of the translations for that word is to kiss or to lower yourself in humility or reverence mm-hmm. or to adore or to completely surrender to another person. And that that's the, that's what that word worship um, is expressing in the Greek. And so what's fascinating is if you think of that of worship as being that to, to kiss or to lower yourself in humility or reverence to adore and to, to surrender yourself completely to another person. Well, that's what Paul describes in Philippians chapter two, when he describes Jesus, he says that Jesus lowered himself in humility, became a servant to mankind, adored us and gave himself up for us looked upon us and loved us, completely surrendered his life to us, uh, placed his life and safety in the hands of his earthly parents. So he completely surrendered himself, right, to Mary and Joseph. And and then Jesus gave us power over himself, even to the point of allowing us to abuse him and to put him to death. And that fulfills the meaning of the word worship in the Greek. So in a sense, yes, Jamal, you you could be right. Uh, Jesus, you could say that Jesus worshiped humanity because Jesus lowered himself in humility and reverence and surrendered himself completely to us. Mm. That was an act of worship. Yeah. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to talk to my friend, Mark Stone about that uh, Hebrew translation, Jamal. So maybe we can get him call uh, the, the heretic happy hour hotline and see if he can mm. correct you or not. Um, but I, going back to something you said, Jamal, I think I, I, I agreed with everything you said about the experience. And w- I think people have a real worshipful experience and there are psychological reasons for that. Um, to kind of give a different perspective on that, I think that's why some people have a negative experience is because I think church is often set up to be like... Um, I really and and I understand Christianity is communal is corporate but when you're like myself when you're an introvert it gets really hard to have these quote unquote worshipful experiences in church because of things like social anxiety which I have and and something like I was never going to raise my hand in a worship service and and a lot of people around me did and they had these like what seemed like profound experiences and maybe they were my medic shot and maybe that you know may, but maybe but it, maybe it was real and they really felt something but there's some of us who have these corporate experiences and that's why we're so repulsed by this this understanding of worship and why we might gravitate toward worshipful experiences that are more uh done in solitude and meditation um alone in the wilderness or something like that because Honestly, like I, I did worship, like I said, for like 10 years, but it's one thing to stand on a stage. It's another thing to stand a bun- around a bunch of other people who are doing things like social behaviors that you yourself aren't comfortable with. And so I think just in our culture, like it, and, and in Christian culture too, it's like it's so set up to be really social and really in- extroverted. For us introverts, it's it's a fucking nightmare sometimes. I just gotta be honest. Yeah, you know, here's the thing. Here, and I totally, I totally agree, Matt. Um, it can be very mimetic for sure. You know, there's a we're, we're copying behavior. It's not even conscious. It's just happening. But I do think, it, but you know, here's the thing that oh, really sure. changed my perspective. And it was like years ago before I even, you know, really left the institution, so to speak. I remember because I was a part. <clears throat> I used to be very hardcore Calvinist. And I remember back in my Calvinist days where it was just so clear, like I love John Piper. I love a lot of the things. It was all about bringing glory to God. Oh my gosh. Where's, where's the heresy John book? Piper? <laughs> oh, dude, I was like a, a huge, 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 like, like a, a, a disciple of John Piper. I mean, I read all the books. I mean, I was just big into that. And, and one of the things that I really gravitated to, and that was this idea that 
God is about God's own glory. I mean, if anybody was a part of that, you know what I'm talking about. So this idea that God is about God's own glory, oh, yeah. you know, even there's scripture taken out of like Isaiah, which says that God, that God is, that God will not give his glory to another, that God, that, that, that is, that would be idolatry to give your glory to anything other than God. So that is the perspective I approached it with. And then I remember I had this total unraveling of that when I was reading the Bible. Because I was reading in John chapter 17, when Jesus was like praying, this is right before his crucifixion, he was praying for his disciples and he said something that blew my paradigm. And I couldn't, I, couldn't, I was like, how had I never see this before? But he basically said, and he was praying to God and he was saying, Father, you know, the glory that, or he said the the love that you've given to me. He said, I passed it on to them, to the disciples. I've given it to them, which is no problem. Nobody would argue with that. The love that you've given to me, I've passed it on. But then he said something that, that was key. He said, but the glory you've given to me. And, and again, like, can God the Father, and this is the paradigm I was back, back, back in the days, the paradigm I had. God the Father can bestow upon God the Son glory because Jesus is the second part of the Trinity. No problem there. But then he went on to say, the glory you have given me, I also gave it to them. <laughs> I was like, what? Ooh. You can't do that. I started arguing in my mind. I was going, that is inappropriate. And I literally, I really was arguing. And in my mind, I was like, you cannot give the kitchen sink away. Like you just gave it all away because glory is all that is only due to God. You cannot give glory to human beings. That's idolatry. And even from you know a Muslim background, uh, that was the biggest sin of... Uh, 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 that you could ever do is to ascribe glory to humans because the only God is worthy of glory. You know, there's all this, this mindset. And I was like, how could I literally was, I started asking. So I asked the question in, in a very honest prayer. I was like, God, how could Jesus give glory to people? That's only due to like, I can understand you giving it to him, but how can he didn't pass it on to us? And then that's where the answer came back was because I don't see the separation. It's just one. Like you are in me, I am in you. We are in each other. There's just one. So this idea that God, you know, glory is is very much like I really believe that we worship when we give other people glory. That's love. We 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 love God by loving other people. <laughs> you know, that's what Jesus said. You know, it's the same thing. It's, well, and and yeah. Yeah. And that's what scripture says, right? You can't say you love God if you don't love your neighbor as yourself. And so the way, we, if you want to show your love for God, you love other people. Yeah. So let's say, if you want to worship God, you need to worship other people. Yes. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, we're just not comfortable. We're just oh, not comfortable oh, with, with interchanging worship with love. You know what I mean? I know. And, but what if we could? But what if, what shouldn't we? But, but like I just said, you know, going back to the Greek, that Greek word, proskinio, uh, it, the, the, the meaning of it is to kiss to lower oneself yeah. in humility or reverence, to adore, to surrender completely. These are things that Paul urges the church to do in the one another's. We talked about the 58 one another's that are all through the New Testament. Well, that's essentially a summary of the, of the, of the one another's, right? Greet one another with a yeah. holy kiss. Serve one another. Consider yeah, totally. others better than yourself. Um, yeah. you know, all, the, all those things are, are said, and technically those are the things you would do if you were worshiping them. Totally. And it's, you know, we're coming up on Christmas season. And so there's a little, there's a hymn out there. Come let us adore him. So, you know, that nobody, nobody is like saying heresy when it comes to like singing that song to Jesus, come let us adore Jesus. But Jesus said, whatever you do, the least of these people, you've done it to me. <laughs> you've done it to me. So what if we could be like, what if we could adore one another? Like what, like, like honestly, like, okay, I'm in a relationship, you know, I'm, I'm engaged to, to my girlfriend Taylor and we're going to be married soon. But what if I could like wake up and go like, today I'm going to adore worship this woman what if that what if i could do that like would that be appropriate would that would would that would jesus receive that worship just as much as if it was directly sung to him or done to him as in a worship song in a church service i think so i see this is this i don't think this is one of those instances where like in one way like i find myself almost trying to disagree with you jamal but in another i'm just like it's so practical because it's like sometimes we we do all this worship towards God and God is this like such abstract um, concept that like, how do we love God in a practical way? Will we love others? That's the only way I know how. 
So I, I see where you're coming from because in, if I if I'm interpreting you correctly, like like I don't know how to love God without in a practical way just loving my neighbor, loving my wife, loving those I meet on the street. Mm, that's so good. Because outside of that love towards other people, like I'm not sure what I can do for God, quote unquote, that doesn't manifest in a practical way actually for human beings or for the cosmos or for the planet or for, you know, the whole of creation, but especially human beings in a practical sense. One of the most, and this will probably bring up our next series, but one of the most, I, I, I think. I heard people use this term thin places. So like when the, the, the realization between the spiritual realm and the physical realm is the thinnest, one of those times is during sex. So when people are engaged in sex, in the act of sex, it you really are connected to that heart space in the sense of where you feel you can really connect to the sense of connecting to God worship. Some people, and again, this is not a joke, but a lot of people naturally will, like during sex will actually cry out and say like, Oh God. And I, I know that may sound, people are going to laugh at that, but it's serious. There's, there is, some, there is some truth to it. Like what makes somebody, and, and you don't even have to be like a lot of people who would not classify themselves as spiritual or, or even religious in any way. Like they're connecting to the, the root of themselves in that act because they're in their heart space. They're so connected. And like, that is a yes. very worshipful. It can be. It doesn't always have to be, but it, it, it can be a very worshipful experience because you're connecting to the essence of your heart. Okay. So man, this is so great. This is a beautiful, this is a beautiful segue, I think, into our next series that we're talking about doing on sex, because you're right. Um, sexual intercourse is an act of worship. And this reminds me of, there's this amazing, uh, I know I've mentioned this before, but I, I just have to at this moment, because it's, it's, it, it, it connects so I think perfectly to what we're saying. Well, so when Jesus talks about how that he says eternal life is to know God and to know the Father and His Son whom He sent. Uh, and he says this in John. The word he the word for know is not information. It's the word gnosko, which is the same word used when a, a husband knows his wife, which means in a sexual uh, intimacy that conceives new life within. And that is exactly I think that's intentional. Jesus is using that word for knowing God and knowing Jesus. And and so if there is meant to be that kind of intercourse, that kind of connection, that kind of knowing a deep, intimate knowing, you know, an intermingling of your spirit and your your heart, your emotions, your mind, your intellect with God and with Jesus and well and as well with other people. Like these are connection points. This is part of worship. This is mm. it, these are pictures of that. And they're not even just metaphors. There is some reality to these things, which is kind of, I mean, and it makes people uncomfortable and it seems kind of odd and weird to mix these ideas together, but Jesus does, the scriptures do, you know, these things are connected. Mm, That's good. It's really good. Yeah. But speaking of weird, I always thought it would, I always thought not to shift gears too abruptly. I always thought Jesus would find it weird how many worship songs we sung to him. Like I, I always felt like when we did worship in the traditional sense, we played all this music. I feel like, like Jesus would be kind of weirded out that we're singing all these songs to him. I don't know. It's just like it didn't seem like Jesus came to have all these worship songs sung towards him. Right. Well, you know that it just seems it seems outside of what his kind of point was. Yeah. I don't isn't know. that Richard Rohr makes the point about that about how. We decided to worship Jesus rather because it's easier than following him. But his <laughs> but his whole his whole point was that he wanted us to follow him, and we decided we'd rather right. just worship him. Well, that is the idea of right. human. That I mean, we are looking for a king in the sense of like, give us a king uh, yes. that we can we can make king and that we can bow down to in that sense. And I don't think that's a healthy. I think that's no, more of an idolatrous kind of thing. And. Um, you know, again, even, even the idea of Messiah, Jesus being the Messiah, the anointed one, I mean, that's true and all, but like in reality, it says that, you know, I know, and Paul says this in Romans eight, but that the creation itself is crying out for the revelation of all of us. Yes. Uh, this, uh, the sense of like, yeah, I yes. mean, so, and Jesus was like, look, it's better if I go so that you guys can, 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 can take this role here yourselves. Like, so this idea of wanting to worship, I think is like the same, the same thing that, 
George Washington, you know, came and set a precedent for our country and running for two terms and not being a king and that kind of thing and stepped down. And then like, what, 50, 60 years later, you, you know, I think I mentioned this on another podcast, but you go to the Capitol Rotunda and look up at the paintings and they have made George Washington oh, yeah. into this godlike figure who is That's sitting right. with the angels and watching over the country and has his hands outstretched. And it's like, what is it about human? And even if you look at other traditions, Buddha, the same thing, you know, that uh, Buddha never asked to be worshiped, uh, to be made into this godlike figure um, at all. But, you know, if you look at the tradition of Buddhism and it, it kind of took that route after he left, he was, he began to be worshiped in that sense, because, you know, uh, it's, it's, it is, there's something about humanity that doesn't know their own identity that does like, I believe, honestly, that's why Jesus is such a focal point in the sense of, I honestly believe a major problem in Christianity is that Jesus is an idol. I actually really think he that he's a major idol in Christianity, and 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 that prevents uh, identification with Jesus because he's an idol. <laughs> no, I, th- I, th- but I, th- I think that's that's spot on. I think like we we often like I don't think Jesus came to start a religion. I don't think Buddha came to start a religion, and it's just so ironic that we then we create these religions centered on figures like that and if if you if you understand each figure buddha and jesus it's like i think they'd be shaking their head right now everybody that has a birthday is like it's like christmas incarnation